protein, as we have come to understand it, is not what we think it is when we talk about the value of protein. Understand this. There has, just like many other scientific scandals in the past in the United States, there is a load of misinformation and then there has been counter information to try to bring back balance. But there has been an abundance of misinformation that has steered society in the wrong direction in terms of what is good for us, what is nutritious for us, and what is beneficial for us. So here's the, here's the breakdown. There's a difference between animal protein and plant protein. So as I've learned from 2021, thanks to the inspiration of Eris Latham and then increasingly others, such as Dr. Bobby Price, such as Dr. Yaki Hickman of East St. Louis, KT the Arch Degree, Dr. Sabi, and a few others. Just like many other scientific scandals in the past in the United States, there is a load of misinformation and then there has been counter information to try to bring back balance. But there has been an abundance of misinformation that has steered society in the wrong direction in terms of what is good for us, what is nutritious for us, and what is beneficial for us. There's a difference between animal protein and plant protein. So now in 2024, I can finally answer the question, why don't I eat meat? And it's what I've known instinctively. And I can actually say it's not confirmation bias that the research and the actual information lines up with my views, but it just so happened that sometimes what you understand as a hypothesis within yourself is based on some real observations that have real truth connected to it. There's a difference between animal protein and plant protein. So now in 2024, I can finally answer the question, why don't I eat meat? And it's what I've known instinctively. And I can actually say it's not confirmation bias that the research and the actual information lines up with my views, but it just so happened that sometimes what you understand as a hypothesis within yourself is based on some real observations that have real truth connected to it. Because I am a student of critical thinking, logic, and problem solving. And so I actually uh, study critical thinking, logic, and problem solving. It's a core part of being a computer scientist and working on computers and technology. So as I try to apply that to this whole idea of 
why meat is not ideal or recommended, it comes down to this. The human body was not designed for meat. Meat is a carcinogen. Meat is a toxin. Animal meat actually can damage human cells. It can damage, it does damage, it's not a can, it does damage the human anatomical structures over time. However, there is a small percentage of humans out of the eight currently nine, eight to nine billion humans, there's a percentage of humans. There's a small percentage. So let's say you got nine billion people here. Within that nine billion people, there's a small circle of people within the nine billion. There's a small circle of people. They actually can eat meat and they can eat it just fine and have less issues than the majority of the nine billion. Meat is not designed for the majority of nine billion people on the planet. You need a particular body and a particular biological structure in order to eat meat properly and thrive off of it. My body isn't designed that way. Mine is not, my body is part of the majority of the nine billion that don't fool with me. My body does, is allergic to it. See, when you're under the age of 30, under the age of 20, many of these issues can be hidden. You can't even see it. You can eat dirt, filth, you can eat poor, you can eat badly, you can eat destructively. And just like anything, when you're young, your body can rebound because you're closer to birth than you are to exit. So what you can do and get away with in your 20s is a misleading indicator. It's a misleading indicator of what is actually beneficial to you in the majority of your lifespan, in the majority of your life. In the majority of your life, For the majority of us on this planet, as we are part of this nature, vegetables and fruits, nuts, seeds, and mushrooms, those are the key elements that activate and elevate our bodies along with the sun, which gives us vitamin D and more than just vitamin D. It actually gives a transmission into the cellular system and mitochondrial system itself. That's an area that science hasn't gotten to yet. But we have ancient knowledge and literature and studies that work with that. And the more that Western science starts to confirm more of the ancient research and studies, it actually gives us more confidence in that ancient literature and those ancient practices to the extent that we can actually take shortcuts. We can do a quantum leap as a society by saying, oh, science is just going to end up confirming a lot of that anyway. So let's not waste our time waiting for science to confirm all of this. Let's not waste our time waiting for science to confirm all of this. Let's not waste our time another 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, or 100 years waiting for these advanced microscopes and infrared uh, machines and equipment and laboratories to tell us what people 5,000 and 10,000 years ago already knew. Let's not wait for all of that still do all of that because it's good to get some of that detail and the description that Western science provides is wonderful. Let's go ahead and use these ancient practices because they actually do work. So, science, Western science is just 
re-identifying these things and putting it under a different name so that it could be patented and copywritten and you can make money off of it. But animal protein is destructive to the body. The elements that you get from beef, chicken, pork, and fish, beef, chicken, pork, and fish, the actual elements you get from those, they are of a lesser quality, a lesser quality than the same elements you get from plants, vegetables, fruits, nuts, seeds, mushrooms. Those have the higher quality versions of these nutrients and more than what you can get from meat. And my dialogue and presentation right now is not giving you a lot of detail about this because these clips that I'm going to show you is what's actually going to give you all the detail. I'm just doing the warm up. I'm doing a warm up before we actually deep dive into this. Right? So, but I do want to try to uh, close this section of the discussion before we get into the deep dive. I do want to close with what I'm able to summarize right now as to why I don't eat meat. I don't eat meat because meat is dangerous for the body. Meat is destructive to the body. Meat lowers the spiritual resonance of an individual. Meat lowers the spiritual resonance of an, of an individual. And yes, some individuals got such spirituality going for them that they can compensate and move beyond that, but that's not a practice for the majority of people who are trying to move through that process, journey, and path to higher spiritual resonance, okay? And then meat, from a scientific standpoint, does not have the nutritional factors yeah, you can see slideshows and, and uh, screenshots that says, yeah, a pound of beef has vitamin B, B12, vitamin E, vitamin K2, and so on and so forth. It'll show you like 12 different um, vitamins and nutrients that beef is going to have, beef in particular. There's a fellow I'm going to show you later on. He's going to actually disprove that. So, so meat doesn't even have all the nutrients that a person needs. And then I am against carnivore because carnivore takes you down a direction of personal biological destruction for those whose biology is not actually designed for the meat. So that's why I don't eat meat. I also don't eat meat because I can relate to animals. I can look at those animals that walk on all fours and I can look into their eyes. I can see them listening with their ears and I can relate to that on some level to where I can never consume and eat a creature that I would have as a pet. I mean, I don't do pets. I don't really believe in pets, but for those that do that, that's fine, you know. Um, I do watch a dog sometimes. Since 2005, sit, 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 sit. Since 2000, since about 2005, I've been asked, why is it that I don't eat meat, right? And I'm asked this question often. My dog loves meat. His biology seems to be designed for it. But you know, the thing is, is that I can relate to mammals in terms of biology. And I couldn't bring myself to consume creatures like that that I can relate to on that, on that level. 
He's out here eating grass like it's salad. Do I know the reasons behind this? I know others do. People who study animals and but maybe I'm rubbing off on them. And then it's like there is no life in meat. Once the animal is dead, and I don't like using that word, but once the animal is dead and you have fried and, and sauteed or baked or whatever, by the time that's on the plate, there is no life in that food. It's, it's lifeless. It's actually a form of necromancy. It's a form of ritualistic consumption of dead flesh. It's exactly what it is. And so it's like, okay, that's not a practice for me. I try to avoid spiritual practices and other practices that deal with death. I just try to avoid it altogether. Right? That's why I don't actually believe in sacrifices. You know, sacrificing animals. Or when we are talking about food that is coming from animals, yes. most of the cases it's coming and uh, I'm just going to say it. Mm. It's a cause of suffering mm. to the animals. Mm. It's in pain of the animals that the food is then created. So-called food is extracted and created. Mm. So energetically, that carries that pain, that suffering that the animal had to go through. And when we are consuming it, we think we are only consuming the vitamins and the proteins and the fiber. Mm. But we are actually also consuming the karma or the energetic suffering that is absorbed into us. So I think because we are seeing food in a holistic a sense, holistic sense. Uh -huh. for us eating plant-based becomes very critical. Even sacrificing, you know, even fruits and that sort of thing, right? You know, unless the fruit is already damaged or whatever, I'd rebury it in the ground as a libation to ancestors, but in general, no, I, I stay away from those practices that deal in death and emphasize practices that deal in life. And consuming meat would go counter to that. At the same time, if you do get into meat and you're buying it at a grocery store, you're far away from the natural processes that what we call so-called predators engage in where they do get life from meat. A wolf or a tiger or a lion, they do get life from meat when they are hunting the prey directly. When they are hunting the prey directly, and that prey, what they, what we label as prey, the lion, tigers, and bears, and wolves, and mountain lions, or whatever, they can get life directly from meat. But the farming practices that humans engage in to deliver meat to other humans does not result in the same life energy transfer to other humans. You'd have to, you'd have to be a, a straight up a raw meat, real time eater in order to do that. I think Mark Zuckerberg talked about that at some point one time in the past. But anyway, that's the only way you could do meat. And many people don't have the stomach for that. And I certainly am not one to engage in that. So unless you were willing to consume that cow, chicken, pig, or fish while it's still alive, right then and there, there's no benefit to your body. So then when it's packaged in the supermarket and kept frozen and they has that fake food coloring on it to make it look like it's red, because you know when it's processed, it's actually gray. But why would anybody want to eat pink slime or anything like that or something that is much more susceptible to taking on E. coli and bacteria and all this kind of stuff? Who would want to really just deal with that? Who would want to deal with a product like chicken where when you unwrap it, you got to like wash a certain way just so you don't catch salmonella? I mean, you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff 
with an orange, a grapefruit, some grapes, and that sort of thing. I mean, you do have to wash it in like some baking soda and that sort of thing because of the way we humans handle stuff in our storage facilities, even the produce section. But at least I can have a farm and some seeds if I really had the resource to do that. And I can grow these vegetables and fruits and I can pluck a grape right off of the vine like my grandma used to have pluck it right off, eat it right then and there, have benefits to my gut bacteria, and move right on. Totally different situation. Can't do that with meat. Meat is inefficient on that basis. It is something that is a more likely to be a carrier of disease, a carrier of things that come against your body, and it is something that you have to work even more with to even make it palatable to the body, to the tongue. And then, on top of that, you're not even guaranteed to digest it properly. So, that's my dialogue on meat, and now I want to show you some clips Thank you, Great Spirit, for your manifestation. I want to show you some clips that illustrate many of these points from the vantage point of actual scientists, researchers, and PhDs. Stay tuned. What do you think is the most important factor in your health? And people agree, it's my diet, right? And I always ask them, has a doctor ever asked you about your diet? Never, never. And I said, don't you find that odd? The most important thing for your health and your doctor never asks you. So this, I found, I found this intriguing, <laughs> but I have over the years actually come to what I think is a, a reason, a rationale for this. It's because we're pragmatic. We don't want to waste our time on something that doesn't work. And the only thing we're taught is the food guide, move more, eat less. And if you try that, you know it doesn't work. So why waste time on it? And I think that's why we never, we stay in our lane. We don't, we don't go in, into nutrition because we don't have the training, we don't have the understanding, we don't have tools that actually work until Ozempic uh, you know, came along. Anyway. So, the other thing my patients tell me in these interviews, almost always, it's, it's shocking to me, they always say, um, yeah, you know, I eat meat, but uh, I, I, I avoid red meat. I'm cutting down on red meat, as though this is, a, you know, something to be applauded. And I find that troubling. I always ask them why, and I get vague answers, and not always clear. Some people are, you know, uh, committed vegans because they think it's less harm animals. Some, a lot of people now think it's good for the climate, that if they don't eat that burger, the weather will get better. Uh, nobody does it for religious reasons that I can detect in my patient population. So I, 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 I started trying to understand this. And, you know, there's not a lot of research out there. So I'm not going to flood you here with charts and graphs. I'm going to tell you stories and uh, speculate a bit. Uh, religion, I think, started out as an important factor, it was vegetarianism. I think, I think the belief is that uh, Christ won't come back until everybody's a vegetarian or something like that. So in, in my intake of new patients, sometimes if they get me going, I, I talk about this. Um, and. Uh, we had a family, I, I take new patients, even though my practice is full now, I, I think we have a responsibility for our immediate neighborhood. So if a new family moves in, I'll take them. And a family moved in and I interviewed them and they were vegetarians. 
And I must have been grumpy that day because I went on a little bit of a rant and I mentioned the Seventh-day Adventist. And then <laughs> my wife gets a text. They, they joined the local mom's uh, uh, WhatsApp or whatever, you know, social media group. And they talk about how they met this crazy doctor who, you know, has these conspiracy theories about Seventh-day Adventists. <laughs> and so my wife was invited to join the group and they gave her an effusive welcome and, you know, our lovely doctor's wife and blah, 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 blah. Silence. But one study, there was a trial where they fed bacon to rats and the rats that ate the bacon had better outcomes, but they didn't include that one. So when I see that, it looks to me like something's not right, right? Out comes my hammer. What is the role of meat in a healthy diet? David Clerfeld was on that committee at the IARC. I read a big interview with him after he had participated in that, and he said the deck was loaded. He said most of the people that came in were vegetarians and that they already had their result and they just had to find the papers to back it up. And he actually described it as the worst experience of his professional life. He leads the ag uh, uh, Nutritional Research Division of the U.S. Agricultural Department, and he's a well-published mainstream nutritional researcher. So he kind of blew the whistle on them. <clears throat> so red meat is a very nutritious food. In fact, it's probably one of the foods where you can live pretty much exclusively on red meat and nothing else as you've seen in earlier talks. And here's a comparison of, you know, what do people think it is and what is it exactly? And it's full of all these wonderful nutrients and micronutrients. But, and this is from Clerfeld's article, he talks about <coughs> red meat and how nutritious it is and all these things, and that it is, it meets the requirements of uh, most of the nutritional shortages that we see around the world. Uh, despite their claims, and he published this about three or four years after the, the committee, uh, he basically debunks it, says they didn't really have the data or the evidence that they said they did. And he concludes, it's likely that the association of red meat consumption with colon cancer is explained either by an inability of epidemiology, and these were observational studies, to detect such a small risk, or by combinations of other factors, such as greater overweight, less exercise. In other words, all the confounding factors. So I think the argument for the health risks of red meat is <clears throat> hollow. I, you know, I don't have time to go through everything, every allegation, but it's all pretty much the same. It's all observational data with very small hazard ratios and lots of confounding variables. And it's agenda driven, in my opinion. But now we have this issue of the planet. So if you don't want to avoid it for religious reasons, and maybe you're not so sure it's bad for your health, well, you don't want to kill the planet. about the absolute best food to help you heal, repair, especially after exercise, but from anything like stress, trauma, surgery, hands down, the answer would be red meat. Now, I recently did a video talking about different proteins, which are a little bit better for certain health conditions. Maybe something's better for anti-inflammatory, etc. But when we're talking about generalized healing and repair, animal meat, and specifically red meat, is at the top of the list. Because not only does red meat have the most protein, it also has some other amazing things that I'm gonna share with you today, which is gonna blow you away. Mainstream is telling you not to do it. The truth is gonna be in the exact opposite direction. Beef, red meat, has more protein and it has a lot of other things that can help you heal if we look at the whole picture. I will say out of all the things that are involved in the healing process and the repair process, uh, we need amino acids. We, we need bioavailable protein, which is going to be animal protein, and we need concentrated protein. It's like the X factor. Actually, it's four things I'm going to mention. And the first one is carnitine. It's this thing that helps transport fat into your cells, into the energy factory called the mitochondria to help 
you get more energy. So without carnitine, the cells can't get energy from fat. Carnitine gives you that quick energy when you're exercising. And since we're talking about a really important transport of fuel to the mitochondria, that is essential for healing and repair of your tissues. So not only do we need all the essential amino acids as the raw material for proteins, not just for your muscles, but for all your biochemistry, we also need other things as well, like those vitamins I just mentioned, which are cofactors, but also the shuttle to allow this raw material to give our bodies energy, carnitine. Then we have creatine. Creatine gives us that quick energy. It can be used as fuel for very, very high explosive, intense movements. Both exercise and physical activity needs this creatine. So this is why you see a lot of bodybuilders and uh, weightlifters and people who do exercise taking this as a supplement. Well, guess what? Out of all the foods that you could possibly eat on planet Earth, red meat from beef has the highest amount of creatine. So creatine is just going to give you more energy to heal and repair from exercise. Now, the next compound I'm going to talk about, which, by the way, red meat from beef has the absolute highest source, is called carnosine. It buffers this pH, okay, from the lactic acid, the acidity in the muscle. So if you're exercising, this compound comes along and helps neutralize this acid to allow you to exercise longer because the pH messes with some of the oxygen in the muscle. So it buffers the pH. It acts as an antioxidant, and it's also going to help the recovery after exercise and just healing in general of your whole body. And it also even decreases uh, something called AGEs. Uh, and I'm going to give you this term. I don't know if you ever heard it before. It's called advanced glycation end products. So it's considered kind of an anti-aging thing. It can help you just live longer. But out of all the foods that you can eat, red meat from beef has the most carnosine. And then we have coenzyme Q10. What is that? That is a nutrient that helps the mitochondria, the energy factory, where food gets converted to energy. Now, and the best source of coenzyme Q10 is organ meats, like beef liver for sure, but it's also in the meat as well. It's also in fish, it's in eggs, but it's mostly in organ meats. So just in general, um, when I was very, very sick, and I stumbled on this ketogenic diet, low-carb diet. Buffalo burger was my first food that I ate that I felt so good. I actually healed my body on buffalo burger and hamburger. In fact, to this day, I still feel the best when I consume um, red meat in the form of hamburger. Now, I will do steak and things like that but I do very, very well on red meat in general. And there's only two conditions that you need to know about relating to the difficulty of digesting red meat. People that don't like red meat really have low stomach acids. And as someone ages, they get older, they will lose their stomach acids and the taste for red meat goes down. They can't really tolerate it. And there's this very simple solution. Just add some betaine hydrochloride to the meal. I'll put a link down below. You just take three to five before a meal. Okay, you don't have to take it forever. Just take it for a month. And what'll happen is it'll start to increase the acidity in your stomach. You'll start to digest the red meat much better and break it down and start feeling better. But when people get older, they just have a more difficult time because they don't have the stomach acid. And they're also going to have, as a parallel thing, uh, gas, more indigestion, definitely acid reflux, GERD, those are all signs of low stomach acid. So instead of avoiding eating it, just fix the stomach's ability to digest it. There is a certain genetic condition where uh, someone has a hard time getting rid of iron. They tend to accumulate iron. And so if that is you, then maybe uh, red meat is not the answer. You would want to do maybe poultry or maybe eggs different protein sources that have lower amounts of iron. But for everyone else, I highly recommend red meat. Even if you're going through your menstrual cycle and you're losing blood, boy, red meat is gonna be the best way to fix it because you're probably slightly anemic 
and red meat has the best iron and B12 in the best form. So put on your little tinfoil hat with me. I went, I sat down on my computer when we were prepping for this episode and I'm like, I'm just gonna, I know the carnivore people and people who eat high protein diets are very loud on the internet. And they yeah. say, I'm right, he's wrong. She's right, she's wrong. Right. And so I just wanted to see where they're getting their information from, where are these studies, you know, what's, what's the other side? So I sit down and I go Google like research on carnivore diet, research on high protein, research on keto. Right. And there is so little research, I was shocked. Because I see these things on Instagram and I'm like, surely these people are saying there's... Yeah. So I looked at one single study that measured, I think it was 1,800, because they had like 3,000, but they threw out you know, 1,800 or whatever. So they had about 1,800 people left of self-reported short-term benefits. Right. So no, they say nothing has been conclusively or even studied for long-term benefits of high-protein diets or of carnivore diets, I mean. Um, but short term, there were, you know, some benefits of X, Y, and Z. And you do not deny that there are some benefits, short term benefits of no, carnivore. We have to discuss the benefits so people understand why people gravitate to those diets and feel better. But I first just wanted to point out how little to zero research is done, yet so many people are so sure that it is the solution for their health and longevity. this high diet high in meat is deficient. It's deficient in vitamin C, it's deficient in folate, it's deficient in vitamin E, it's deficient in phytochemicals, it's deficient in magnesium, it's, it's deficient. So how could these people on these, their, their diet's deficient, it's producing too much acidity, it's aging their joints, it's promoting cancer, and it's just absolute craziness and people love to follow it. So I'm actually shocked right now to hear you call out these nutrients that it's deficient Folate in. Folate only comes from plants. Vitamin C comes from plants. Vitamin E comes from plants. Right. Vitamin, you know, all these things come and from you plants. And here on the yeah. internet, actually, people are now saying, there's like posts on it, people believe it, that plants have nutrients or anti-nutrients anti -nutrients to, yeah. and like a poison for yeah. you, essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, all yeah. animals, like humans from the beginning of time have been eating berries, plants. All, so it's- And primates. We're primates. Totally. Which fully eat plants, right? And we have the undeniable data. And here it's 2024, but here's a study from 2023. Let me just, let me just say, give you the title of this study. Low carbohydrate diets, low fat diets, and mortality in middle-aged and older people a prospective cohort study. They divided people into cohorts and a medium follow-up, medium of 23.5 years with more than 165, almost 166,000 deaths. Imagine the amount of people you have to follow to get 165,000 deaths. They had to follow like a million people to get 165,000 deaths. Okay, so they were able to categorize all these huge amounts of people over 25 years. This is an incredible study published last year. It's just phenomenal. Okay, and research categorized people as eating either a healthy or unhealthy low-fat or low-carb low carb diet. And what do you think they found? Of course, what they found. All these <laughs> thousands of people and thousands of, hundreds of thousands of deaths. What they found is that low-carb diets contributed the most to early life deaths below age 70. Really? With people on keto diets, 28% more likely to die of any cause. Really? Any cause of cancer, cause. heart disease, take your And pick. participants on an unhealthy low-carb diet, that means not carb, more unhealthy, low carb, more unhealthy proteins, like more, more meat and bacon and processed foods, increase their mortality risk by 38% every year. 38% increase of death every single year they will follow. These people are dropping food. off fly, like flies. Yeah, it's you know, franken food. It's just craziness, yeah. right? It's not real food though. It's, it's manufactured in a plant that is filled with sugar and all these processed stuff. Well, we're talking about animal products here. We're oh, talking but about local. Processed foods as well. No, no. I thought that um, was 38% over the years. No, participants on low-carb diets, oh. when they were on unhealthy low-carb, which unhealthy low-carb means they were having more red and processed meats. Oh, I thought you meant like sugar candy. Like no. Could be, oh, okay, okay. No, no. But, that, but okay, so that's one aspect. And then we have other studies coming out, pretty much the same thing, with the same um, effects. It's right, I think it's right here this study coming out in the Lancet. This is really interesting, okay. coming out in 2018. Okay, people who had the lowest amount of carbohydrates had the highest amount of premature death, yes, true, 
but people who got more than 70% of their energy from carbohydrates also had a higher risk of mortality. I see what you did there. There's an optimal range. Right, so here's the thing is that less carbohydrates bad, too much carbohydrate bad. True, people could argue because too much carbohydrates they're eating maybe more processed carbohydrates like rice or you know white rice or white bread, yeah. But still, when they went and analyzed all the long-lived societies and long-lived populations, they found there was an optimal carbohydrate range in those in the blue zones as well and the optimal fat range. So we're saying here, and then the people that live the longest, who were the people? So this is a published in The Lancet, 2018. The title of this study is Dietary Carbohydrate Intake and Mortality, a prospective cohort study and meta-analysis of all the studies, right? And they, eat, they follow the eating patterns of like more than a half a million people around the world, like half a million, you know, half a million people we're talking about. And they found that when you replace carbohydrates with animal products, more death, but both high and low carbohydrates were associated with increased mortality. The sweet spot of the longest life were mid-ranged when people got more protein and fat from high quality carbohydrates like beans and high quality proteins like nuts and seeds. When you're on these keto diets with carbohydrates restricted, you, from meat, dairy, fish, or any kind, you raise IGF-1 into cancer-promoting levels, and that's insulin-like growth factor one, which is a, um, a hormone that promotes cellular replication and promotes angiogenesis, allows cells to, cells to replicate and get a blood supply. So it allows tumors to grow as you're maximizing muscle mass, it allows tumors to grow. So extra protein, even though it may promote a little more muscle mass, extra animal protein promotes IGF-1 And then it also changes the bacteria in the gut, which means it from unfavorable bacteria, bacteria in the gut promoting, promoting TMAO formation, which is trimethylamine oxide, which is a pro-inflammatory substance that ages us and promotes atherosclerosis. And then it also changes the bacteria in the gut, which means it from unfavorable bacteria, bacteria in the gut promoting, promoting TMAO formation, which is trimethylamine oxide, which is a pro-inflammatory substance that ages us and promotes atherosclerosis. I'm saying that it's people that they, um, fat is bad and they cut too much fat of the diet, bad. Mm -hmm. People who put too much, they, carbohydrate is bad. They cut too much carbohydrate of their diet. They yeah. want to be keto yeah. or they want to be zone. But, you know, the zone, is 40, 30, 30. 40% 30. 40 carbohydrate, 30% fat, 30% protein. Keto is 70%, is less than 30% protein, 30% um, fat. I'm sorry. Ke the keto is less than 30% 30 30 carbohydrate. Yeah. So it's like 20% carbohydrates, 30% fat, and 50% protein. 50, 30, 20, something like that, or 40, you know, something in that range. They want to keep carbohydrate really low. Maybe fat's the most thing they eat, like 50% fat, 30% um, carbohydrate or 20% carbohydrate after 50% fat, leaving 30%. Wait, I have a question. Are protein. you saying if for like keto or carnivore, someone that's eating a very meat heavy diet, say it's just like meat and vegetables, you're saying that diet, if it's mainly meat, is higher in fat than it is protein? That's correct. Meat is more fat than protein. Really? Meat's higher I don't fat. think I knew that because yeah. people are protein obsessed, protein crazed. I, I feel like mm -hmm. that's their number one reason for going carnivore or keto is right. because they're like, I just need a ton of protein. It's like a hamburger so is like 35% protein yeah. and then like 65% fat. You know, yeah. most meat is, is more fat than protein. Right. But even if the leanest cuts of meats, are, it could be like 50-50. Yeah. Maybe chicken or fish might be more protein than, than fat. But in any case, they're getting, they're still getting an adequate fat and protein, mm. but they're restricting carbohydrate. And what the studies are showing, so I'm saying here, the studies show two very interesting points. One is that carbohydrate goes down and deaths increase. And once you cut down to a lower amount of carbohydrate, particularly in keto, you have the highest amount of what's called early life deaths or premature deaths. Now an early life death is a death before the age of 70. The average, um, the average male lives to be about 75. So if you're losing more than five years of life, early life death before the age of 70 for a male, that's what keto diets show when they're tested long term. And I've got a whole bunch of studies in front of me, like 20 different studies that show the same, that all corroborate each other. And the carnivore diet, would be the height 
of a dangerous diet. The most dangerous diet you could eat would be a carnivore diet. It's hard to believe. People believe this not with craziness, right? Mm. They didn't eat nothing but meat. So they have almost zero carbohydrate because we know that the risk of animal protein creates disease in a dose-dependent relationship. The more your diet restricts carbohydrate, and we're needing carbohydrate, we need protein, we need fat, but as you restrict carbohydrate and too low, you increase the risk of death. And the optimal carbohydrate intake, based on all these studies, optimally, is probably between 50% carbohydrate and 70% carbohydrate. The optimal fat protein ratio is not the 80-10-10 that the fruitarians and the and part of the low fat vegan community are advocating, but it's more like a nutritarian diet. A nutritarian diet is more like 60-20-20 or 70-15-15. We're talking about 60 to 70% carbohydrate and 15 to 20% protein and 15 to 20% fat. That's what the nutritarian diet runs around based on eating you know, a few ounces of nuts and seeds a day. And that's what the scientific literature has from all these studies. Those are the ranges we get where we get maximum lifespan and the most centenarians, most healthy, long-lived people. We have so much data here today, and I'm gonna show you some of this incredible data. But the point I'm making is it's pretty interesting because it shows that there's an optimal carbohydrate range there's an optimal fat range, and there's an optimal protein range for longevity that people don't even have never heard of or are not considering because the advice they get from these people speaking at all these conferences and lectures and that they, they are not accurate. So beans and nuts and seeds were the major factor modulating death here and life. More, more longer life, less less life. Okay, so it says, source of food, the whole plant foods, mod modified the association between carbohydrate intake and mortality. What, it meant, what that means is that this tracking of carbohydrates and mortality was showed up because people had either restricted carbohydrates too low, or when they went too high, they didn't use whole food sources of carbohydrates. Totally. Because whole food sources of carbohydrates have protein and fat in them except for fruit. So fruit is the only whole plant food that isn't high in protein. The other plant foods, there are five of them, intact grains, vegetables, beans, nuts and seeds. I'm missing one, I guess. Is there four now? In intact whole grains, I guess there's only four. Intact whole grains, vegetables, nuts and seeds, and beans, right? Those are the four sources of, because fruit is the sixth category, but fruit is kind of low in protein. Right. The only way you can make a plant protein consistently too low in protein is with too much fruit because it'll diminish the amount of the higher protein plant foods you're eating. So as your diet moves towards fruitarian and excess of calories from fruit, lowering the amount, pushing off your plate, those higher protein plant foods, then your diet can become too low in protein as we age and require more protein. Really what it comes down to is education. At least you look at the education, look at the studies because you don't have a choice if you don't know, but now that you know, you have the choice. You could feel empowered to make the decisions to choose plant protein over animal products, to choose health promoting foods, spend more time in the produce aisles, all that stuff. But it all starts with education and knowing you have options. Right. Let me give you an example of some high protein foods right now. Some really super high protein plant foods. Plant protein? Or? Yeah, plant protein. Got it. Because that's the key here. So the message here is more plant protein intake extends lifespan. Mm -hmm. Even among plant foods, paying attention to protein does matter, mm -hmm. but it's not, but, so you gotta get more plant protein. So lentils and beans, more than 15 grams of protein per cup. That's a lot of protein, 50, you know. Okay, edamame, 20 grams of protein per cup. That's a huge amount of protein. Hemp seeds, 10 grams of protein for just three tablespoons of hemp seeds. That's a huge amount of protein. We're talking about protein, you know. Broccoli, 10 grams for two cups of, bro of broccoli. That's like a little box of frozen broccoli, a small box. Pumpkin seeds, 13 grams for one and a half ounces. Almonds, 10 grams, one and a half ounces. We're talking about these plant foods, mostly beans, seeds, green vegetables, and nuts. So green vegetables, seeds and nuts, beans and legumes are your highest protein plant sources and enables us to design a, pro a diet with adequate protein for the elderly people who require more protein. Mm -hmm. And to give anyone a longer life. Didn't you say... And, start uh, yeah. now, start now. Yeah, this, Absolutely. Is, this is what we're talking here about all the studies on protein and lifespan. Mm -hmm. And these studies are all corroborative each other. They corroborate each other with a high degree of accordance, which the high degree of accordance means they all show the same thing. The higher, 
So we're, so now that we're talking about we don't want our diet to be higher in animal protein. We do want it to be higher in plant protein. And just for the people that have always, I've seen this question so many times, am I too late? Should I mm -hmm. change my diet or am I too late? If mm -hmm. you are living, breathing, speaking, writing this message, you're not too late. Well, they're alive. So they could live better. They could maintain better health. They could even get healthier if they're alive. Yes. Once they're dead, they can't get healthier. Right. But yeah. it, that's what I'm saying. If you're writing this message, you're not too late. So there's always right. time to change and improve your diet, improve your life and health span. Right. The living. If you are going to live, why not um, live the best you can? Be the healthiest version of yourself possible. If you're going to stay alive, then do it right. Absolutely. which has all 20 amino acids that make up all your proteins. Now it's recommended that you eat 0.8 grams per kilogram per day of protein per lean body mass, unless you are over 65, healing from surgery, pregnant or lactating. And those folks, you just need a little bit more protein. There's quite a few special properties about black beans that make them a better quality protein than many other popular proteins that people choose to eat. This may be opposite of what you have heard as historically, Quality was defined by the best protein sources that can make a baby rat grow. Baby rats thrive on cheese and other animal products. People are not rats. And beans aren't directly animal products, although the animals that people eat can eat beans to grow. Now, if you are into muscle building like a bodybuilder, then you know how important the essential amino acid leucine is to grow muscle tissue. And did you know that one cup of black beans has more leucine than one cup of lean pork, cheese, chicken, turkey, or three ounces of lean sirloin beef with the fat trimmed off. Now foods with lectins, which is a group of proteins found essentially in all plants, have been villainized by some social media influencers. And that's because they don't have a complete understanding of lectins. Now lectins are easily removed from any bean. There's multiple ways to do it. If you pre-soak your beans overnight and then boil them for 15 minutes, you will destroy 98% of the remaining lectins. Just soaking them removes most of the lectins as they are water soluble. Now 30 minutes of boiling will destroy all the lectins. If you don't pre-soak your beans, then you need to boil your beans for about an hour. Just know that slow cooking your beans will not destroy as many lectins. But sprouted beans have less lectins and your body can also deactivate some lectins. Now, if you've ever cooked any beans, you know it takes probably at least 40 minutes of boiling to get it soft and edible. That's why I choose to use a pressure cooker. Lectin poisoning is not common as most people who eat beans want it soft enough so that they can crush it on the roof of their mouth with their tongue. The animal, plant, and human already have lectins inside them. Faba beans has been shown to change colon cancer cells back to normal cells by lowering cholesterol due to the soluble fiber and faba beans can widen your blood vessels because they are rich in potassium and magnesium, two essential minerals that too many Americans are struggling to get in their diets daily. Now, my favorite way to eat soybean is in the form of tofu, but I also eat soy noodles, soy sheets, soy pudding, edamame beans, and I drink soy milk. Although tofu and soy milk are processed, these foods are not the same as soy protein and soy protein isolates found in ultra processed foods, which don't have the beneficial micronutrients that have been tested for thousands of years. Now, my ancestors have been eating soybeans and minimally processed soy foods like tofu since the largest and most complex macronutrient and they serve as a structure or a scaffold of your entire body. And this is why people focus on foods high in essential amino acids, which are nine amino acids that your body can't make. Proteins not only make your muscles, but your connective tissue that hold your bones and joints together, your skin and the hair on your skin, your bones, your blood vessels, the sacs that surround your organs, and proteins are a part of every cell in your body. Half a cup of soybeans is equivalent to the protein found in five ounces of steak. And unlike meat, Soybeans have no cholesterol and very little saturated fat. It also has no harmful hormones like estrogen or antibiotics that can cause you to pick up multi-drug resistant bacteria. Soy has always been my quick and easy protein source. I especially like tofu and soy milk because they are easily absorbed as they have very little dietary fiber. First, you can't store protein. Whatever you don't use for the day, 
that gets stored as fat. And that's an excellent way to gain weight just by eating a lot of protein. But usually it's the other foods that come along with that protein, like fat, that causes the most weight gain. Now in nature, you're never going to find protein alone. It's always with some other energy source, either fat or carbohydrates. Now, if you eat animal products, you're going to eat more fat. And if you eat plants, you're going to get more sugar with that protein. Digesting proteins and processing proteins, that's really hard work for your body, especially your liver, which has to get rid of the nitrogen waste that is on all the amino acids. That nitrogen becomes a neurotoxin called ammonia, which is the same ingredient as in your window cleaner. Ammonia is pretty toxic. So it needs to be turned to urea for your kidneys to urinate that out. Unfortunately, excess urea can acidify the urine, causing kidney stones. Now, to prevent this, the quality of your protein source is super important. And avoiding foods with super high amounts of nitrogen, which are found in branch chain amino acids, will lower your risk of diabetes. And that's why you should eat number six, azuki beans, which are excellent for obesity and diabetes prevention. Azuki beans are average in regards to calories and macronutrients and are middle of the road micronutritionally as well. They're the best source of zinc on this list, which is used in DNA creation and maintaining a healthy immune system, and are among the best sources of potassium, phosphorus, and copper. They contain a wide variety of antioxidants, including polyphenols, anthocyanins, and flavonoids, which combat damage caused by free radicals radicals and are shown to have anti-inflammatory effects. Adzuki beans are also shown to improve heart health, aid in digestive health, and reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes. Adzuki beans do contain notable amounts of all of the anti-nutrients I mentioned in the intro, though they are shown to have a lower concentration of lectins than most beans. These beans not only have the soluble fiber casein that is so important for your metabolic health, like black beans, it also has phytonutrients like polyphenol that inhibit digestive enzymes. Now, why would you want to stop some digestive enzymes? Well, when you slow them down, you actually slow the rate of absorbing your nutrients, which keeps you full longer and leaves more food for your gut microbiomes that lives in your colon. Now, beans also have resistant starch, which are prebiotics that your gut microbe love. The target for fiber is 30 grams a day. But unfortunately, many people fart short and can't even reach 15 grams a day. And that's why every opportunity that I have, I make sure that my food is fiber rich and I encourage my kids to eat more whole food fiber. But they don't always have the time and that's why number five, peanuts are a convenient and nutritious health food. Now my dad grew up during the World War II era and he learned quickly peanuts were packed with nutrients. A cup of peanuts also has 39.94 grams of protein Peanuts are very different than peanut butter. And when you eat whole peanuts, there is just no way your teeth can grind that peanut as smooth as peanut butter. Peanut butter is essentially a highly processed food. And because it has so much surface area, it allows the digestive enzymes to quickly and easily metabolize it. So it's much better to eat whole peanuts as it'll take time for your enzymes to break that down and to reach the nutrients. You probably only absorb 60% of the calories of eating whole peanuts because the fiber traps the rest of it and then it gets flushed down in the toilet. Another convenient food to eat is number four, pumpkin seeds, which is rich in protein at 35.21 grams per cup. Now I usually sprinkle them in my salad or add them to grains and beans. And I try to eat a little every day, not only because they are full of protein and fiber to reduce blood sugars, weight, and cholesterol, but pumpkin seeds all help to maintain healthy hair as shown by this randomized trial on hair growth. That's the benefit of eating whole foods. It talks to your entire body in so many ways. Now, if you don't like peanuts or pumpkin seeds, and how about number three, almonds? A cup of almonds have 28.93 grams of protein, and they too have the benefit of being convenient. Now, did you know that almonds reduce skin wrinkling? People who eat lots of meat and processed foods simply look older because they have a ton of skin wrinkling. It makes sense. They're eating foods that constrict their blood flow. And as a result, the smallest, tiniest blood vessels called capillary, they go to your skin. They're struggling to get blood flow to get nutrients to your skin. But you can begin to reverse that damage with number two lentils, which has 50 grams of protein in a cup that's pre-cooked. Lentils, unlike beans, are easy to cook and can be whipped up in 15 minutes. There's no need to pre-soak them, but I usually at least rinse them. Sometimes I'll cook it in veggie broth, maybe three cups of broth to one cup of lentils, and I add 
a couple of bay leaves and a couple of tablespoons of equal parts turmeric, onion, cumin powder. If it is too dry, I'll just put in more water and then bring it to the boil with the lid on top. Now, I don't like to add salt to my food, but for my family, I will add a tablespoon of miso paste, which is the only sodium salt proven not to raise blood pressure. This is not surprising because miso is made from fermented soybeans. Without eating enough of the right foods, you won't get protein. And without protein, the body won't grow, heal, or defend itself against infectious diseases like pneumonia, which remains the leading cause of death around the world. This protein is also bad unless you're actively building muscle by athletes and young children. The rest of us will just get fat and fatty liver and a weakened immune system because there's no way for your body to store that extra protein except as fat. So unless you have special needs, like trying to heal a gaping ulcer, if you are eating enough food to maintain your weight, you are likely overeating protein, probably about twice as much or more than you need. Now, the number one highest source of natural foods, if you exclude chicken gizzard on the USDA list of protein, is pink beans, which are 44.02 grams of protein and only 0.05 grams below the chicken gizzard. Pink beans, or Santa Maria pinquintos, are similar to pinto beans, and they have a rich, meaty flavor. They should be pre-soaked, and cooked with the methods that I outlined above. your arm and you get a scab on there the same thing happened internally when something has struck the walls or the tissues that's inside of your body they scab over too what scab them over is cholesterol so people will say cholesterol is bad no cholesterol is not bad and and, and, and you having chole high cholesterol is not a bad thing it's saving your life if you didn't have the rips and tears in the, on your internal organs or eternal organs, should I say, if you didn't have the rips and tears in the venous system, then the cholesterol wouldn't be there clogging up them places anyway. See, we are constantly looking at things going on in our body and we're acting like our body is attacking itself or we acting like things are wrong with our body. But our body is just so intelligent that we end up killing it, thinking we know better than our body when we don't. There's really no such thing as bad cholesterol. You can't have melanin neurotransmitters without cholesterol. Cholesterol is what surrounds the cells and protects the cells. It's called the cellular membrane that's made of cholesterol. You have liquid crystals that flow throughout the bloodstream and flow in and out of the cells, actually helping you exchange things through the interstitial fluid. That's cholesterol. You can't fire off. You cannot fire off a, a, melanin, a, a, a melanin transmitter without cholesterol. Your neurons. Guess what carries the neurons throughout the brain and throughout the body? Cholesterol. Guess what helped patch up internal bleeding? Cholesterol. See that the whole thing is just like mucus. Everybody think mucus is, is the, uh, the culprit. They think mucus is the bad guy. It's not. Without mucus or without your mucus membrane, it would be impossible for you to live. You would die of all types of outward invaders coming in and just hijacking your body because what the mucosa membrane does is it it lines the inside but outside of your body. And the reason why I'm calling it the inside but outside is from your mouth to your anus, it's inside of the body, but it's not inside of the cells. See that? This is a hollow tube. And what keeps things from getting inside of the bloodstream and keep things from getting inside of our connective tissues is this thick mucus layer that starts in your mouth, goes down your esophagus, all throughout your digestive system and end up at your anus. So even though your digestive system or this tube is on the inside of your body, it's really on the outside of your body because the only way into the body is by way of the bloodstream through blood capillaries. So even mucus, when you're talking about mucus, 
Mucus is a defense. Mucus don't cause disease. Now, excessive mucus buildup because mucus puts out fire. Again, mucus and calcium, it literally neutralizes acids. And then these things get engulfed by the mucus. Then mucus moves it into something called the interstitial fluid. Once it goes into the interstitial fluid of the body, it goes to something called the, uh, the lymph capillary vessels. Then it goes inside the lymph nodes and it gets broken down or degraded. And then it goes to the kidneys and then you urinate it out. You see that? So this stops the proliferation of cells. So what is the problem? The problem wasn't the mucus. The problem was eating the acidic form and foods that, bring, that brought mucus in the body to become a defense. The problem isn't the calcium. The problem is the things that you're eating that's obstructing the artery walls that's going to bring calcium, calcium to that artery to scab over to heal that part of the body. The problem isn't the parasite. Now, what happens is if you're constantly eating meat, if you're constantly eating protein and all these acids, mucus starts excessively building up because it feels like it constantly got to put out fires. So mucus on top of mucus and then calcium coming in and then acids, it solidifies. This solidification spreads on top of the cells and then it sucks the cells of its oxygen and then it smothers the cells so that cells can't breathe or it can't do the exchange through the yeah. Through the uh, through the pneumocytes and it can't exchange oxygen for carbon dioxide and then the cells suffocate and it dies. You see that? The problem is the things you feed in your body that pleomorph these microorganisms into parasites because they have to get bigger to eat all the degraded waste and the metabolic waste that's in the body. So you will blame the parasite. You will blame the mucus. You will blame the cholesterol. You will blame the calcium. But these are not the cause to your disease. These are not the causes to your illness, to your illnesses. These are the effects. So we need to get past the effects and we need to go to the actual root cause. And it's what you put in your mouth and it's this polluted, toxic environment and what you're bringing into your internal environment, y'all. So when you start looking, one of them is meat consumption. And look, everybody be like, well, my grandma lived 130 years and she ate meat. But did she live 130 years in her health? Or was she on a deathbed? Was she blind? Did she have did she have hypertension? Did, what, did she have diabetes mellitus? Did she need to get her foot cut off? Was she on bed rest the whole, the whole 20 years before she died? We talking about the actual quality of life, not the quantity of life. And then the people be like, well, we used to be hunters and gatherers. If you look back and you read the literature, they was dying of these same diseases today. We acting like these are new diseases. They even found cancer back then. And then if you see what they was eating back then in ancient Kemet, in ancient Egypt, ancient Egypt, guess what they was eating? They was eating wheat. They was eating barley. They was drinking bear. And they was eating all of those meats. So I'm finna show y'all whether the meat was treated, cured, whether the meat had, uh, uh, had antibiotics, whether the meat was steroid free, whether it was grass fed and organic, that don't mean nothing. It goes against our molecular structures, meaning it will go against our body because it's full of used, already used proteins because most of the meat you eat, eat the things you're supposed to be eating. And what I mean by that, most of your meat, when it's alive, it eats simple amino acid structures from plant material. You do not eat meat that eat other meat. Now, some of y'all, you eat meat that eats the things that you're supposed to be eating, that your biological molecular structure was designed by the creator to eat in the first place. You created your own middleman. You've been indoctrinated and you're dying because of it. That's exactly what's happening. So heart disease, it comes from meat consumption. I'm going to show y'all this through the literature. Diabetes, it comes from meat consumption. Do you realize when you eat meat, meat comes with lipids? Yes, phospholi uh, 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 polypeptides, phosphate lipids. And then these lipids are very, very oily. Guess what these lipid does when they enter into the bloodstream? It got nutrients in it. It gets delivered to the cells of the body. It can't make it into the cells. So guess what it does? It teams up with cholesterol and help form this little glossy seal. I call it a sealant because it's basically what it is around the cells. So now glucose need to make it into the cells, but glucose can't make it into the cell because glucose is sitting in the bloodstream waiting to be delivered into the cells. But you got this thick ass solid or what you were going to call polypeptide lipids that's around the actual cell that can't penetrate the cells, instantly get alerted by the actual beta cells of the pancreas and the islands of Langerhans. It acts as a key. It's trying to unlock the door to let you to let glucose in. And guess what? It can't do it because they have the wrong key. No, the key ain't wrong. 
The key ain't wrong. It's the protective part that's around the door that's wrong. And that's what's happening with meat consumption. So meat consumption actually causes diabetes and it causes heart disease. Excessive proteins cannot be broken down by our body. It is something called, uh, it's called high homocysteine. High homocysteine is happened when you eat a bunch of meat. And this homocysteine is actually breaking down from methylthionine. And when you see the methyl, uh, methylene getting broken down to these components, it breaks down into homocysteine. Homocysteine causes all these problems. And I'm going to show you and take you through the steps of what happened and how this stuff gets stored up. First, it gets stored up into the blood. The blood say, hold on. If I change my pH, because remember, these are kind. Look, these are very, very, very complex amino acid structures. It's too much pH for the blood. It's changing the pH. Too much hydrogen and nitrogen in them. The blood, if it changes from 7.45 to 7.43, I believe, you would die of alkalosis or acidosis. So the blood will put it into the interstitial fluid. Then this starts messing up lymph flow. So the lymph flow will be like, oh, hell no. So guess what the lymph flow will do? The lymph will push it into the connective tissues. Now you got all of this, all this proliferated, yes, acidic protein in the connective tissue, causing you gout, causing you all type. Because remember, calcium coming. Calcium causes gout. Only reason why gout is in the tissue and between the bones is because it's trying to actually neutralize all the proteins that's between the connective tissues. Now, what happens is this don't work, so the body do a last attempt to heal itself. Guess what it does? It turns this actual homocysteine into full 100% protein or what you will call collagen. And then what it does with collagen, it forces it back into the artery walls for the body can get rid of it. But collagen goes deep behind the, the basal membrane of the arteries and digs itself into the cells. Just like this. This is an artery. This is collagen. Basal, when, whenever you get into the healing space, basal means basement. This is the basement or the basal part of the actual artery wall. This is nothing but pure protein. Now, look. You see how it's pinching the artery because it's building up and building up because you have too many excessive proteins. So now you stop blood circulation. This is called obstruction. So imagine it's going to the heart and then you got all these proteins that have built itself up in the basal uh, uh, area of the actual arteries and you can't receive no more blood flow to the heart or vital nutrients to proliferate the cells. That's what you call the heart, a heart attack. What happened if it's in the ganglia area of the body or what you'll call the cervical area of the body and it stops all blood and uh, circulation and oxygen circulation and nutrients from going to the brain. You call that a stroke. So if you go, really going to take it for what it is, heart attack and stroke is caused by what y'all eating meat, meat consumption. And that's what it is. All right, so here go an article, and it's plenty of these, y'all. It's plenty of these. It says cure meat, vegetables, and bean foods, and relate in, in relations to childhood acute leukemia risk population-based control study. And it just shows you how cured meat. We're gonna go through cured meat, natural meat, all of that, and it's just showing you how children is actually getting all these different types of diseases from everything. But fruit, we <laughs> everything but fruit. I want y'all to read that. And it's basically talking about the consumption of cured smoked meat and fish leads to the formation of carcinogenic or nitrogen compounds in, a, in the acidic stomach. And you read through this, it shows you the method, the results and everything. I'm not making this stuff up. So that's one of them. You can look it up. And this is uh, the number to check it out is uh, PMC2653. Uh, five four zero. Look it up. All the cite uh, citations and everything are there. Here go another one. This is talking about, and check this one out. This is a very good one. I love I love this read. And it says, in order for human stomachs to break down meat, it must have high. It must be high in hydrochloric acid, which we're not. It said the stomach of humans and herbivores produce less than one twentieth of the acids produced. By carnivores and a lot of people is wondering why they got too much acid production inside of their stomach and, and, and if you look at it so you have a bunch of different processes that happen in the body when you actually eat fruit you have an alkaline enzyme called emulase or emulose this is what actually breaks down your fruit or fructose then when you eat vegetables you have something called trypsin this actually breaks down your glucose well when you need to start these break down your carbohydrates and carbohydrates we're just talking about carbon hydrogen and oxygen all right now when you start eating proteins or what you would call plant protein, you have something called, it's, it's called pepsin. 
Pepsin creates pepsinogen. This creates a hydrochloric acid to go higher. This breaks down plant protein, showing you that your body is made for plant protein. You don't have an enzyme to truly break down meat. So it'll break it down into bits and pieces, but then still big chunks are, are left out. So what it does is it goes to this small, uh, it goes through something called the duodenum, which is right here. I'm going to show you. So it'll go through the duodenum. So you would, you would eat this, you would eat this protein, right? Dang, I got orange peel in, uh, in my hand. You eat the protein, it'll go through the cardiac sphincter or the esophagus, then it end up in the stomach, right? Once it end up in the stomach, it goes into this small tract. This is called the duodenum. Inside the duodenum, notice you have the actual tail end of the gallbladder here, and we're going to talk about that too. But notice inside of here, it, it's a bunch of blood capillaries, a capillary bed, and it's a bunch of bacteria that helps break down your food. Look, your body is actually made to break down sugars, and it's made to break down amino acid structures that come from your vegetables and is made to break down fat. It is not made to break down animal meat protein. It's not. And this is why when you eat animal meat protein, it don't get broken down all the way. Bits and pieces of the peptide chain be left over and it starts to knock over the capillary beds while it's trying to go into the bloodstream. It gets into the bloodstream super big. This is what you call excessive protein. The body then start taking and they say, hold on, you can't be in the blood because you're going to kill me. And then it stick it into what you would call the interstitial fluid. The interstitial fluid is where the exchange of nutrients, the exchange of gases, because oxygen is a gas. Carbon dioxide, these are gases. This is where the exchange go. So you're not getting the exchange uh, from, from the pneumocytes, from oxygen to carbon dioxide. You damn sure ain't getting the phytonutrients you need because you can't uptake them and absorb them because you have, you have obstructed, putrefied meat still there that's not been broken down all the way. So the body say, hold on, man, I got to get you out of the interstitial fluid because my cells can't freaking breathe or can't eat the phytonutrients. So then it sticks it to the connective tissues. Now you're having all types of problems wrong with your muscles, wrong with your connective tissues. You really think you got arthritis, but technically it's not arthritis. It's just all these damn acids is burning the ligaments and burning your connective tissues. So then that hurts. So the body say, let me make this one last attempt. It breaks it down and it turns it into collagen, brings it back into the bloodstream, take it to the arteries, and then it literally goes and builds up into that little basal membrane side of the cells and this is what's causing your heart disease proteins when you look at kidney failure what damages kidneys y'all animal protein what they gonna check they gonna check your creatinine ain't they they're gonna check your buns number your blood urine and nitrogen nitrogen comes from where oh protein oh nitrogen that's in the blood huh you you using the bathroom you seeing all that foam that's after your urine that's that's protein leaking from the kidneys Messing up the nephrons. Nephritis, that's protein damage to the nephrons. That's protein damage to the kidneys. Because your, your kidneys is not supposed to actually break down proteins. See that? It's not supposed to break down proteins. There's certain things that the kidneys bypass and bring it back into the bloodstream to be recycled again. So whenever you see proteins being leaked from the kidneys, it's because the proteins then tore up the kidneys and is leaking in your urine. You can't tell me one good thing about animal protein. Again, I'm not talking about vegetable protein. I'm not talking about, which is nothing but amino acid structures. And I show sure ain't talking about fruit proteins or what you'll call simple or mono amino acid structures. I am here talking about complex amino amino acid structures that come from eating animals flesh or their byproducts it byproducts it is killing us family so this is what i was saying it says in order for human stomachs to break down meat it must be high in hydrochloric acids the stomach of humans and herbivores produce less than 120th of the acid produced by carnivores because we cannot digest meat properly our pancreas must unnaturally produce more hydrochloric acid see that ulcers Leaky gut because too much acid is being produced because your body is trying its hardest to break down its protein. You see that? It says inviting disease and sickness. After the meat passes through the stomach, it goes to the intestines. Humans take about 12 to 8 hours to digest their food, while carnivores only take 3. And this is where you call putrefaction sets in. Putrefaction sets in, you can't get rid of the things because the hydrochloric acid is not hot enough to break these proteins down. So then what happens is the microorganisms get tired of working trying to help break these pro these uh proteins down through fermentation because you can't ferment a protein, you only can ferment a sugar. Showing you that you're supposed to be on a sugar diet, not a protein diet. 
a galactose diet that comes from your mother's milk, a fructose diet that comes from your fruits. You see that? What you would call a monosaccharide, a glucose diet that sometimes comes from your vegetables. Never a putrefaction diet. The amino, the, the actual microorganisms that's inside of our stomach, inside of our intestines is made to ferment food. We go through a fermentation process. We don't go through a putrefaction process because it don't, it takes too long for our bodies to fully digest uh, 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 vegetables. It takes, it takes a long time to even for it to fully digest certain fruits. I mean, when you eating things like cucumbers and your melon family, they take about two hours to fully digest and pass through, but even fruits take a long time to digest in the body. Imagine proteins sitting there rotten in your gut. Same thing that roadkill look like on the street. It don't break down easy because it's protein. Same thing if you die right now, rigor mortis sets in. It's going to take a long time for your body to decay. Guess what helps break down your body? Huh? Microorganisms. Guess what these microorganisms turn to when they're breaking down a dead body? No, if, notice if you see anything dead that's, that's of terrestrial descendants. You're going to see parasites, you're going to see flies, you're going to see maggots, and you're going to see worms. Because the microorganisms have to pleomorphize themselves to eat different food. To eat different food. It's kind of like me. If I wanted to eat a damn 50 pound burger, if I could pleomorphize myself to become a bigger person to eat it, I would do that. Because it's going to be impossible for me to, to eat a 50 pound burger. My cells have the actual gift of pleomorphizing. I don't, but my cells do. So when they see things that they need to get rid of to keep it from harming the body, they will change their structure and functionality to actually eat these things. Guess what you call them? A parasite. Guess what they have you believing that you got it from outside of your body when it was inside your body the whole damn time coming from the glaring of your cells. Now, am I saying that you can't catch a parasite from outside the body? I'll be lying. You can, you can catch toxioplasmosis from a cat. You can, you can catch a fluke worm from stepping on dog poop. So you can catch parasites from outside the body, but guess where these parasites started from? Inside of something else cells. Most of these things starts from the body and you're getting it from your food. The food need to be broken down. The body's trying to save itself. So it'll pleomorphize the microorganisms that's trying to ferment the food. It's going to change them for they can actually putrefy the food and y'all will call it a parasite. These are the facts, family. Not making none of this up. And I'm going to show you how to get rid of this stuff. I mean, of course, the first thing is stop eating meat. It gave me, look, that and the drugs I was on when I was younger, all, it gave me a heart attack. They, they said I would never heal my heart, not heal my heart. Here go another one, y'all. It says the metabolism and significance of homocysteine and nutrients in health. Now, remember, homocysteine actually come from high consumption of eating meat. Now, homocysteine is very, very bad for the body. They call it HCY. All right. Now, look what it says. This says it says shown in several age related pathologies such as osteoporosis, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson disease, stroke, cardiovascular disease. Also, HCY is associated, but not limited to cancer. You see that aneurysm, hypothyroidism, renal stage disease. Renal means uh, kidney, y'all. Look, vitamin B, C deficiency, vitamin 12 deficiency, folate deficiency. And this is all in a meat enriched diet, y'all. Y'all can get on common Google right now and see how you get high levels of homocysteine in the body. It's going to tell you from heavy meat consumption right now, y'all. We have to quit eating meat, y'all. There's no way around it. Look, check this out. Does high levels of homocysteine in the blood and in the body come from eating meat? Let's see what it says. According to WebMD, homocysteine is a common amino acid in your blood. You get it mostly from eating meat. <laughs> High levels of it are linked to early development of heart disease. Y'all see that? Homocysteine is a common amino acid in your blood. You get it mostly from eating meat. High levels of it are linked to early development of heart disease. In fact, a high, a high level of homocysteine is risk factor for heart disease. Most of your heart attacks, most of your strokes, most of your osteoporosis, most of all the things that's going on with your body is related to meat consumption. Y'all can, can't nobody jump on here and tell me wrong. We got all these, these Caucasian doctors, you know, champion for this carnivore diet. And most of the people that's been on a carnivore diet come to me now. 
And I told him that I said, y'all going to end up getting renal disease, listening to these doctors, eating all this meat. Of course, she's going to feel good in the first place, in the, in, in the first half because you're fasting. You're on a mono diet. You're only eating meat. Of course, your, your ketones going to kick in. You're going to drop weight. You're on this high fat diet. You're going to feel good. Your brain going to be firing off because in a, in a sense, you are intermittent fasting. You're not eating all day and then you're limiting your, your, your diet to just fats for real. So of course you're gonna you you you're not getting that much sugars no more. You're gonna see your muscles build up. You go your abs gonna come in, but then you gotta face the consequences a year later. You are gonna have to face them consequences. And most of y'all come see me because y'all kidneys start failing. Why is the kidneys failing? Because the proteins is damaging the nephrons. You start having heart pa uh, palpitations. Why is your heart and your rhythmic frequency of your heart is off? All oh, because something is blocking the arteries and keeping blood from flowing properly to that heart. Oh, you got a bunch of migraines and headaches now. What's going on there? Oh, you blocking the actual arteries to, to get blood actually to the brain. Oh, your bones is hurting now. Oh, you not absorbing. See that? You're not, di you're not digesting, absorbing, you're not utilizing, and you're not eliminating because you're eating the wrong foods. See, it all sounds crazy. Everybody call me a quack. Everybody say I'm out of my mind. But everything I say is always coming to pass. Why is that? And I'm not the only one saying this stuff. Just because you read it don't mean it's true. They pay scientists millions and millions of dollars a year to their campaigns to tell lies about their studies. You got to know. You got to feel what's wrong and what's right. And then you have to get out here and get in the field and seeing if it's working on people. We have to just quit reading and taking people word for it. Get out in that field and you see what meat eating is doing to people. And guess how you see what it's doing to people. Somebody come to you sick. They're nine times out of ten. Three of their meals out of day is going to have meat on the plate. Remove the meat off their plate. Remove the grains and the gluten off their plate. Remove all these things off their plate. And then and don't even give them herbs. Just remove the meat and the grains off their plate. Tell them to come back in two months. They're going to feel much better. Arthritis goes away. Inflammation goes away. Swelling of the internal organs goes away. Blood pressure goes down because you don't need hydrostatic pressure or, or, or oncotic pressure anymore because you don't have nothing blocking the airways or the artery waves. So you're not forcing the blood to press against the arteries to make it to the heart. So hypertension, high blood pressure goes down. You see that systolic and diastolic levels goes down. Your 180 is now 120. Your 110 is now 80 or 70. Now you neutral. Now you're normalized. You 120 over 70 and 80. You back normal just by eating the right foods. All look, all of, it's all in our face, y'all. We are just in denial because we in, we are addicted to what we've been eating, family, and we have been indoctrinized by the allopathic community and by the televisions and by the radio stations and by the line ass education system in the schools we was put through, forced to go to. And you know that it ain't natural because our children don't want to go there. And then half the time we got to beat them to act right and do good in school because they naturally not feeling that bull crap that they teaching our children. We can't even comprehend the stupidity and the lies that they are teaching us. And then they say that we have mental disabilities. We have a learning disability. Yo, children ain't got no learning disability. They peeping the bullshit and it don't make sense to them. And you should ask yourself, why do this stuff make sense to you? Have you been indoctrinated? So thank you for going on this journey with me. I do hope you made it this far. And I hope that I have sufficiently answered the question of not only why don't I eat meat, why do I stay away from meat, and why I would never eat meat. I hope I've answered those questions. But I also hope I've answered the question of, from the standpoint of present day, 2024, scientific research study and scholarship from those that spent 15 years, 20 years, and in some cases, 40 and 50 years of their life looking into these questions of why meat is one of the worst things that humans can consume and why the body is not designed, the majority of us, our bodies are not designed for meat. You can just flow with your blood, your, your fluids, your energy, right? Then you are more equipped to be able to do a wide variety of things, right? So we don't want to slow down. We don't want to be held back. 
and things like meat, processed oils, processed sugars, and these um, fake made up breads and the vast majority of stuff in these supermarkets and, and whatever, a lot of stuff is not good for you and it holds you back. It suppresses you, it suppresses the human being, right? And then you could throw that stuff away and you could just do uh, real vegetables, whole vegetables, whole fruits, plants, nuts, seeds, right? And the right oils and mushrooms and that sort of thing and the right liquids like coconut water, spring water, because purified water is not good for you. And then if you can use distilled water the right way with like trace mineral drops and stuff, and you can do herbal teas, when you can do that kind of stuff, then you, you are enabling the human body to be a better platform for the spirit. That's what it's all about. Your intellect, your mind, and your spirit now has a rover. It has a, a it has a, a, a operating system and hardware, even though it's more than that. It has the actual tool set, physical tool set to interact with this reality more to the level that it wants to, right? And if we could treat our gut right, then that spreads through the whole system, up and down, and we're able to be more effective as living beings on multiple dimensions, spiritually as well as physically and in between. So that's my take on diet, nutrition, and most especially the avoidance and the elimination of meat from the diet. I hope you find this well. I will see you on the next one. Thank you.